This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is the greatest piece of music ever written. Discuss. It was the first symphony to feature a chorus and vocal soloists. The words they sing were written by Beethoven himself and by Friedrich Schiller, an ode called To Joy, about the universal brotherhood of mankind. It astonished audiences and critics alike at its premiere, and it was his last completed symphony. These are the facts. The aura that surrounds the Ninth Symphony, though, has transformed fact into fantasy, myth, and legend in the almost 200 years since its premiere in 1824. It is at or near the top of every list of the greatest pieces of music ever written. Its status as the last of Beethoven's symphonies created a mystical boundary beyond which other composers dared not go. It has been played, in whole or in part, at some of the most momentous occasions of the last 200 years, including the fall of the Berlin Wall, and it has become an anthem of freedom around the world. How did this piece come to have such a hold on the world, musical and otherwise? Even critics were divided about its worth at the beginning. Many early audiences wrote it off as the ravings of a deaf lunatic, and even Beethoven's friend Louis Spohr, who was a great admirer of his colleague's early works, drew the line at this one. Its first three movements, he wrote, in spite of some flashes of genius, are to my mind inferior to all the eight previous symphonies, end quote. And he found the finale so monstrous and tasteless that I cannot understand how a genius like Beethoven could have written it, end quote. And yet, wrote Hector Berlioz, there is a small minority of musicians whose nature inclines them to consider carefully whatever may broaden the scope of art, and they assert that this work is the most magnificent expression of Beethoven's genius. That is the view I share." End quote. Even critics who had problems grasping this symphony tended to echo a sentiment that these writers express. Whatever you make of it, this is the work of a master. Like all of Beethoven's symphonies, the Ninth was conceived as a grand experiment. In its length, half again as long as any symphony that had come before it, in the choral finale. Is it a symphony, an oratorio, or what? But so were his other eight symphonies, which are full of their own avant-garde moments. The fact that it was his last symphony may make it seem more radical than the others, simply because we have no idea where he would have gone next. Beethoven himself could show where the implications of the Eroica or the Pastoral might lead, always building toward new advances from one symphony to the next. But that momentum comes to a magnificent climax with the Ninth. Beyond it were only uncharted waters, with no guide to point the way for future composers. The path of the Ninth Symphony itself is perfectly clear. It is a victory symphony one of Beethoven's many musical journeys from darkness into light, like his third and fifth symphonies and his opera Fidelio. The opening is shrouded in mystery, strings and horns playing an open fifth of A and E. Is it major or minor? It isn't until the 13th measure that it's clear that we are in D minor, stated with an emphatic fortissimo. By what seems to be the full orchestra, but Beethoven has some surprises in store. The audience is already wondering what the singers are doing on stage, the trombones, piccolo, contrabassoon, and percussion, apart from the timpani, are also silent until later in the piece. Beethoven runs through a series of subsidiary themes, including melodies that hint at the famous finale. And puts them through a tense process of development and recapitulation 
before the movement reaches its almost apocalyptic coda. The opening of the scherzo recalls the wide open intervals of the start of the first movement, but this time they are not shimmering mists, but hammer blows led by the timpani. The movement grows into a contest between the almost elfin scurrying of the strings and the timpani which keep interrupting the scherzo's ongoing flow. At times, the pounding leads to a galumphing swagger. In even sharper contrast, after the gentle pastoral woodwind tunes of the movement's middle section. The Adagio introduces the soulful side of Beethoven, the diametrical opposite of the athleticism of the previous movements. It unrolls as a set of extended variations. Mostly, these involve the first violin's tender melody that graces the opening. But to a lesser extent, Beethoven also develops a second theme. Which flows a bit more urgently. the hush at the end of the adagio, is broken by the presto that opens the finale. horrific explosion by the orchestra that is followed by a very curious passage that must have puzzled its first audiences, an almost vocal recitative played in unison by the cellos and basses. Although there is no text, the recitative seems to be asking questions and the orchestra responds with answers that allude to material heard in the preceding movements. After considerable back and forth, the low strings announce the famous theme that will become the fuel for what is essentially another movement of variations. The first three of these variations involve just instruments, weaving in threads of greater complexity until finally, after the movement's opening eruption returns, the bass soloist sings a real recitative with words by Beethoven, 
Oh, friends, not these tones. Rather, he sings, let us tune our voices in more pleasant and more joyful song. And the joyful song, now sung, is the principal theme we heard earlier in the low strings, this time with the words from Schiller's ode, To Joy. The continuing variations bring in the chorus, The soloists, separately and together, and orchestral treatments as varied as a Turkish march, a vigorous orchestral fugue, and some passages of high-wire vocalizing. <laughs> leading us to and through his grand choral finale. <laughs> this ode was far from Schiller's finest literary achievement, but attached to the intensity of Beethoven's expression, it has come to symbolize the highest aspirations. Friedrich Nietzsche argued that Beethoven's music is music about music, but ensuing generations have begged to differ. Beethoven's Ninth has come to be music about the hopes and dreams of humankind. <laughs> This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.